Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Bitcoin here hanging on at $29,300 per coin. Uh, still finding a desirable spot here to just chill out right in around this support level that we saw bounce off in June, uh, bounced again in July before we made that new all-time high for Bitcoin. So we are kind of seeing Bitcoin price just kind of chill in this zone here. Same with the rest of the crypto market. XRP still finding support in and around here at about 40 and a half cents. Um, not what everybody wants to hear. However, that's just the nature of the market at this point in time. Credible Crypto though here on Twitter, he posted this and as you guys can see his name, Credible Crypto, he still thinks we are in a five wave structure and the five wave structure moving to the upside is actually an elongated mega bull run in that these uh, bear markets in the meantime have actually just been the corrections to a bigger picture scenario here. So you guys can see the leg one, which would have started in 2011 going through till the end of 2013, that correction into 2015, the next leg up, which would have been that second bull cycle, which would have been the uh, the third wave there. Of course, that correction down in the infamous bear market of 2018, 2019 that many of us experienced, and now the final leg up. So we are actually experiencing a five wave structure in and amongst the last wave. So the one, two, three, four, five, starting uh, in mid-2019, going down here to the second wave, uh, correcting back up for that first high. And now we're seeing that 55% retracement, guys. We're here, the fourth wave down before that final leg up. And so what he's saying here is that our wave two and wave four corrections in this cycle have been deeper and longer than I was expecting, certainly more drawn out than mid-cycle corrections of prior cycles. This has resulted in a longer cycle than prior ones expected, but also deeper corrections. Continuing down here, he says, on most alts across the board, which I was certainly not expecting, uh, since our first impulse from 3,000 started back in 2018, I have said my plan for spot was to load up on my favorite, fundamentally sound coins, and sell at the end of the five wave cycle, knowing that the largest gains occur in the last 10% of a major cycle. So uh, if you were to believe this, then the final 10%, we are going to see the highest gains, guys, in this particular uh, point here of the cycle. And understanding that there will be speed bumps along the way, I've also pointed out that most alts will likely have their final major runs after BTC tops, just like we saw in 2017 as money rotates into altcoins during peak euphoria stages. So, uh, also what he is stating here is that this final wave up, like we've been talking about, is when we're going to see that altcoin cycle that we thought was going to happen somewhere in around here, but it did not happen. And that could be because this is a major elongated bull cycle and uh, we just have not seen that final leg up yet. So continuing on down here, with this being said, I am down on many of my spot holds over the last couple of months, just like many of you are. Some are even underwater, but the plan has not changed. The targets haven't changed. My plan from day one has not changed. Despite the unexpected speed bumps along the way, deeper and longer mid-cycle corrections, we are following the timeline originally set out quite well, and the thesis has not changed. I will see you all at the likely end of the cycle sometime in 2023. So an interesting perspective here, again, looking at it as a major bull run, and we are in the final wave, the five, the fifth wave of this major bull run. And from 2019 on, here's where you can pinpoint the uh, the waves within that final wave, the fifth wave of this bull run. So we are in the fifth of the fifth, where he says, you know, the majority of profits will be had. He says, you know, this is likely going to go into 2023, though. Some probably don't want to hear that. Many probably don't want to hear that. Although, uh, you know, this would be the last time to pick up some good fundamental cryptocurrencies, the ones that solve problems. As Credible Crypto here says, he loaded up on some of those fundamental coins uh, when Bitcoin was uh, back to $3,000. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how wrecked everybody feels at this moment in time. I mean, if you're still hodling from 2018, you probably are feeling, well, maybe a little down, but still up on your portfolio. Um, some interesting advice here from Credible Crypto. Uh, also this guy, so Davos, the major event has been happening over the last few days, and this from Digital Assets Daily. Christina Gorgieva says, don't abandon crypto after the Terra crash. So she's staying on message here. Uh, obviously, she is uh, the head there at the IMF. People shouldn't completely shun the crypto world after the most recent collapse of the popular stablecoin Luna Terra. Uh, USD or sorry, UST imploded earlier this month, setting off a chain reaction that saw overall value of the cryptocurrency market slashed by hundreds of billions of dollars. But Kristalina Gorgieva says this: "I would beg you not to pull out of the importance of this world." 
And again, she said this at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos. It offers us all faster service, much lower costs, and more inclusion, but only if we separate apples from oranges and bananas, she said. Adding that it's the responsibility of regulators across the globe to put up guardrails and offer education to protect investors. So the big talking point here, cryptos with utility are going to be the cryptocurrencies that thrive. This has been a major theme, guys, at Davos. There's uh, a lot of Davos World Economic Forum news uh, that has been coming out over the last few days. So I'm going to be covering some of that today. Uh, Gorgiev noted that there are many different types of assets with varying levels of associated risk. For instance, there's a big difference between stablecoins that are backed by cash and other assets and those that rely on algorithms to maintain their value, like the TerraCoin, for example. Uh, stablecoins are a type of... Okay, so then this article just talks a little bit about stablecoins and their fundamentals. Here's another quote, though. The less there is backing it, the more you should be prepared to take the risk of this thing blowing up in your face, Gorgieva said. But she added that not all digital money should be tarnished with the same brush. Don't paint us all with the same brush. Does that sound familiar to you? Michael at Val5 Links also bringing this up with uh, regards to a U.S. senator saying Terra investors may be victims of fraud. So just kind of going back to Terra because uh, the, the Terra Luna story, that is part of this. Pennsylvania Senator Pat Toomey told Barron's uh, that Terra may be a fraudulent project. The Republican lawmaker has pointed to the fact that Luna promised huge returns while offering very dubious technology. Toomey, who recently introduced a draft bill focusing on private stablecoins, added that investors were possibly misrepresenting the nature of Terra. But this stance here, a little controversial. Even Brad Garlinghouse spoke out at uh, at Davos, and here's just a quick clip of him talking about the Terra Luna fiasco. Listen to this. Putting it into context, you know, I, I'm going to give Luna credit. He said something to me before we started talking. You know, some people are calling the, the Luna overall debacle a Ponzi scheme. And he said something that I thought was actually really insightful, which is it's not a Ponzi scheme. It's not a Ponzi scheme because he did exactly what he said he was going to do. A Ponzi scheme is when you're lying about what you're doing. And you're running a pyramid scheme, you know, but, but you're lying. The, the whole UST Luna experience, he published a white paper and said, here's what I'm going to do, and then he went and did it. So, look, I, my general view of what happened in the last seven weeks, clearly uh, we've been through some market resets over time. I view it as probably net good for the industry in the long haul, but certainly painful in the short. So Brad Garlinghouse giving his opinion on the Terra Luna fiasco. I mean, they did have the white paper. Uh, people knew what they were doing. They were being transparent about what they were doing. It just didn't work. So I think that's very insightful. Um, I guess this is Brad here talking at an event uh, over there in Davos. But the landscape is changing. I mean, even Kristalina Gorgieva says, uh, you know, she's using that same <laughs> that same saying that we heard Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson use back in 2019, back before the lawsuit was announced against Ripple and XRP. Don't uh, don't paint us all with the same brush or a variation of that. Digital money should not be tarnished with the same brush. So this has really opened up uh, the world's eyes, I think. And uh, now that cryptocurrency is getting more exposure uh, in the spotlight on the world stage, in this case at Davos 2022, I think more of the world is going to take notice. So I wanted to thank uh, James Barrood here for posting this. Because here's what we're finding, guys. Another one from Michael at Val5 Links. 13% of unbanked Americans have used cryptocurrency for payments and transfers. This is a survey by the Fed. Cryptocurrencies have become a relevant topic for the Fed. This is the first time they are included in one of the surveys to better understand adult customers' experiences with emerging payments. And on May the 23rd, the U.S. Federal Reserve released a survey titled Economic Well-Being of U.S. Households in 2021, which included several topics related to how involved Americans were with cryptocurrencies. The survey was conducted among 11,000 adult Americans between October and November of 2021 to learn about their economic situation and what type of investments they engaged in. The Fed found that a large portion of adults with high incomes greater than $100,000 held investments in cryptocurrencies. Those who held cryptocurrency purely for investment purposes were disproportionately high income. In addition, the research concluded that there was an increase compared to last year of people using cryptocurrencies as a form of investment, even surpassing those who use them for transactions or purchases. This translates into greater confidence on part of adult investors. 
So you got to remember, back during the last bull run, uh, this wasn't the case. The demographic for people who uh, held cryptocurrencies uh, in terms of an investment opportunity was geared towards more of the gamblers, I guess maybe I would say. Younger people, uh, people jumping on the bandwagon, the fad. Not so much uh, baby boomers, I guess. But now we're seeing that number change a little bit. Only 1% of respondents said they use their cryptocurrencies to send money to family or friends outside the country. This shows that very few people in the U.S. still prefer traditional remittance services or even the legacy banking framework for international money transfer. So, you know, we're not seeing the numbers that we hope for. I mean, this should reflect more people. I don't know where they're getting 13% of unbanked Americans, though. Uh, just looking through this real quickly. Okay, down here. According to the survey, 99% of people who invest in cryptocurrencies without using them for transactions also have a bank account. In contrast, 13% of the unbanked are more likely to use crypto as a means of payment as opposed to pure investment or speculation. Um, so there you go. More likely to use it 13%. However, they're finding here only 1% of respondents said that they did use cryptocurrencies to send money to family or friends outside of the country. Um, interesting statistic there. We're still not there yet, but, you know, um, with a push from the IMF and, uh, you know, with cryptocurrency being now on the world stage, I think we are more likely to get this. Uh, Mike Manfield here bringing this up with regards to a Ripple partner connected to Ripple. This has to do with Union Bank, a bank in the Philippines. Again, one of those countries that does really rely on those cross-border remittances. Well, Union Bank in the Philippines has now issued a blockchain-based digital bond. They're issuing a digital bond registered using blockchain technology. The issuance amount is at least 1 billion pesos, or $19 million, with an expectation of uh, PHP, the Filipino peso, 9 billion, and is part of a pre-announced bond program of 39 billion PHP. HP. The Philippines uh, Depository and Trust Corp, the country's central securities depository for both equity and debt, is running a proof of concept using distributed ledger technology. Union Bank's issuance is part of the digital registry and digital depositories trial. Uh, in other words, DLT will be the ledger of record for the bonds. The listed 1.5 year bond has a 3.25 annual rate. HSBC and Standard Chartered are uh, joint lead arrangers. 18 months ago, Union Bank and Standard Charter co created a blockchain platform for retail retail bond issuance as part of a proof of concept to tokenize uh, 9 billion PHP in bonds. We're guessing this is the same platform. Earlier this year, the bank partnered with IBM and digital custody firm Medico, uh, likely also for this project. So uh, we are seeing Union Bank, a Ripple partner now, decide to expand and uh, offer more services uh, using blockchain technology. So that's interesting news. And considering now what we're seeing at Davos, uh, you know, bringing the cryptocurrency crowd in, the timing of this ISDA is interesting. This coming from Matthew L-I-N-Y. They are also calling for crypto regulations globally as the World Economic Forum meets this week. So, for those of you guys who do not know, the ISDA, they are the International Swaps and Derivatives Association. The International Swaps and Derivatives Association is a trade organization of participants in the market for over-the-counter derivatives. It's headquartered in New York City and has created a standardized contract to enter into derivatives transactions. And so what do they do exactly? Well, the ISDA is a private trade organization whose members, mainly banks, transact in over-the-counter or OTC derivatives markets. This association helps to improve the market for privately negotiated over-the-counter derivatives by identifying and reducing risk in the market. And guys, what they are doing now is they are looking into the regulatory clarity portion for cryptocurrency. So uh, this is just uh, more about the ISDA. Over 980 member institutions from 78 countries. These members comprise of a broad range of derivative market participants, including corporations, investment managers, government, and supranational entities. So this is the real McCoy. And here's what they're trying to get down to the bottom of, uh, talking about uh, spot price, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and their futures, sufficiently high to support effective hedging. The basis between spot Bitcoin and Ethereum and their respective futures has historically been relatively muted, which would enable effective hedging. The basis is within the same magnitude as the basis between large equity indices and their futures. So uh, just talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum in terms of uh, using them and their spot prices for you know futures trading, uh, ETFs, they talk a little bit about ETFs here. The point, though, that I think Matthew here is trying to make is that now they are actively driving to regulate this all coming at the same time, coincidentally, as he's mentioning, all coincidentally coming at the same time, as he's mentioning here, as Davos and the World Economic Forum are now um, are now publicly because I want to say publicly because we've always known 
that they have had a special place for certain cryptocurrencies, but it's never been such a public outpouring of support for, let's say, Ripple and XRP as an example. It's always kind of been behind the scenes in, uh, you know, us in the XRP community doing our research and finding the connections. That's how we have come to the realization that, you know, organizations like the World Economic Forum are going to utilize cryptocurrencies in the future. But now, guys, this is for the mainstream. This is all over Twitter. This is uh, everywhere. The World Economic Forum accepting this and uh, Matt just pointing this out too, how the ISDA is also now looking at, uh, at uh, seriously regulating crypto products. So here we go. Annual meeting 2022. This brought to us by Cryptotainment here on Twitter. Brad Garlinghouse at the World Economic Forum sitting beside Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire. Brad Garlinghouse on remittances at Davos. Listen to what he says. I'm going to ask all of you to reflect on why... Um no, what do you think, first of all, actually, remittances can do for recovery in the aftermath of the pandemic? You know, we know that, as I said, remittances increase post-crisis. So what role do you think they're going to have and how can the advancements, as we have seen, in uh, digital money technology really support this use of uh, um, you know, sort of remittances through you know, mobile money? Brad, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, you know, look, I agree with everything you just said, and the point that I, you know, jumps out at me the most is in a moment of crisis, these are the kinds of uh, money movements that are the most critical to a population that is most uh, fragile. You know, it, the WEF's motto is about, you know, improving the world, and I, I think it's almost a tragedy that the people who can least afford it are the ones paying the most. Looking at your data, you know, we can say that the, the mobile wallet at 1.7% and celebrate that that's much, much, much better. But I would ask the question of like, why isn't it 17 basis points? Like, you know, it, money today is ones and zeros. You can send an email to anywhere in the world for effectively nothing. Why is it even 1.7%? Uh, and I think the, the good news is we can get there. There are hurdles, uh, and more so than anything else, I think the hurdles is the incumbency of existing players, and I mean that as well as to corporates as well as governments, who sometimes don't always have a shared incentive of what's in the best interest of those populations that might be most fragile and in most need of those in a moment of crisis funds from loved ones, home, what have you. So Brad Garlinghouse here advocating for even cheaper cross-border payments. Why does it even have to be 1.7%? And there's a story behind this. Of course, there is the incumbent uh, legacy system that Brad is talking about here, and uh, they're looking to be replaced. The big banks, the major you know organizations right now that conduct cross-border payments, uh, for example, SWIFT. Cryptocurrency-based companies like Ripple are coming onto the scene and they are threatening uh, their dominance. And so what is going to happen now? Uh, so, you know, we also have Jeremy Allaire stating his opinion on this, this courtesy of XRP Shark here on Twitter. We have to preserve digital cash. That has to work on the open internet. It has to work interoperably with anyone anywhere. That's how we're going to solve this problem. And I think we're really close. I mean, USDC itself um, has, we've seen over three and a half trillion dollars of transactions directly on the internet between counterparties. And, and so um, if we can, you know, improve it with more scalable blockchain technologies like, you know, Brad's company uh, provides, and we can make this extremely low cost to, to move uh, and then enable individuals with digital wallets that can, uh, that can interact, and you can scale into the risk. Right? You can scale into the risk. So this is Jeremy Allaire, uh, again, CEO of Circle, the USDC coin, that, uh, that stable coin that uh, I think for all intents and purposes is considered one of the more legitimate uh, independent stable coins out there. Uh, and he said, we can improve. He said, you know, he's given us the statistics and how much USDC has been transacted over the internet. But he also said we can improve it with more scalable blockchain technologies like Brad's company, i.e. Ripple, like the Ripple company provides and make it extremely low cost to move. So the synergy here, you can see these guys are not in competition whatsoever. Jeremy Allaire even, you know, going on the record at the World Economic Forum saying we need a company like Ripple to scale this. And how is Ripple going to scale this? Well, of course, there is the on-demand liquidity portion uh, to get those payments moving no matter what the size. If you have the liquidity, you can convert one asset to another, no problem. So I'm glad Jeremy Allaire said it. And, uh, you know, as we're seeing here at the World Economic Forum Davos 2022 conference, although they have opened up to the cryptocurrency players, who do you see here on the main stage? Brad Garlinghouse obviously having a seat at the table. Jeremy Allaire, another one. 
But as we saw with the dot-com bubble, only a few companies survived. A handful of cryptocurrencies will change the world of finance. XRP certainly going to be one of them. That's just my opinion, but I want to hear what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.